Will you please turn in your Bibles with me to Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6. And if you've looked ahead, it's not a typo that we're only doing seven verses today. I know sometimes we do really big chunks in Acts, but today we're just doing seven verses together. Last time we went through Acts 4 and chapter 5, but just really 22 verses in there on as the uh, early church started experiencing some suffering and some sacrifice in terms of following Christ and growing the church. And gospel activity, as we looked at last time, includes a measure of uh, suffering and, and challenge in doing that. And so are we preparing for that and are we prioritizing for gospel service? And then God does things and it's exciting. It's not all bad. There's the success in gospel service as well. And so that, that whole theme of opposition continues throughout Acts, but also the, the key themes in Acts, as we've talked about several times now, are got the gospel progress as the gospel progresses throughout uh, Jerusalem and it spreads from there all the way to Rome, some key people like Peter and Paul, and then of course the power of the Spirit of God, and that's what really starts the church. God's people are baptized by the Holy Spirit, and that's when the church begins, and they're empowered for ministry. And we're seeing that over and over again in Acts as we go along. So you can check out that whole series outline on the right side of those message outlines we sent out. But for today, we're focusing really a simple message, I think, as we head toward communion a little bit later in our service. In Acts 6, they, they run into some uh, some conflict internally, and we've already seen, you know, in Acts 5, some internal conflict, but we see that again here, and then how they end up sharing and ministry responsibility. So when we look, how, how did the early church handle conflict? How do we handle conflict as a church? And then also this sense of increasing ministry load. There's always something more to do in service to Christ. How did the early church handle giving that out? And then how do we handle it? So this is really a small case study as we look at Acts 6 together. So have your Bibles there, hopefully. That outline, a pen or pencil, and follow along with me. We're going to start, and we're just going to take it verse by verse because it's a little chunk. And we're called, the bottom line is we're called to share in ministry responsibility. And in the first four verses, we focus on shared responsibility, responsibilities. And this is the section where there is... Um, a need that is recognized in, in, in a conflict here. Verse 1, in those days, so Luke is you know, writing and, and responding back, and he's collected his info, and he, so he refers back to the early church. When the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews, you, you see the word hell, they think like hell, heaven, no, that's not it. It's Think Greek background Jews, Jews that didn't live near Jerusalem. And so the Hellenistic Jews... Uh, among them complained against the Hebraic Jews, think people, the Jews that were from Jerusalem area, because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. And I put on your outlines this for this first verse, assume internal misunderstanding and conflict. So you had some people responding to the gospel that were from Jerusalem. So they, would, they spoke Hebrew, they used the... Old Testament, what we call the Old Testament now, the Hebrew Bible, and they read it in Hebrew. And they, they spoke Aramaic as well. But you also had Jews that didn't weren't from, and Jewish Christians that weren't from Jerusalem. And they would tend to speak Greek, and they used the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament. And they might, you know, spoke Aramaic a bit, but maybe, maybe a little bit of Hebrew, but there were some language barriers and and different backgrounds, same faith, they had a background of Judaism. Now they've responded in faith to the gospel, and they're trying to work together, and there's this clash. And part of Judaism, as well as Christianity, is taking care of the vulnerable, including widows. And so there was a food distribution, there was a meeting needs, which is a wonderful thing. But as develops with people from different backgrounds, we see that in our culture all the time, there was this clash a bit. And there was either a misunderstanding or a genuine conflict that the, 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 the Greek background Jews were complaining that the Jewish background Jews were taking care of their widows and overlooking the other widows that were from their background. And there was this clash and this, hey, this isn't fair. This isn't going well. And, and maybe that was happening and vice versa. Who knows? 
But notice this internal misunderstanding in conflict. And there's a need identified, and it often, often comes to the surface in some type of conflict. Well, this isn't fair. We're not doing this properly. We're missing people, and so on. So, instead of ignoring it, the 12, and we see the 12, that's the 12 disciples. Remember, they got one more appointed after Judas, you know, got he's gone. So, they act to seek shared solutions. Look at verse 2. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, It would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. And when you hear that sentence, it sounds kind of bad. But catch, and we're going to catch the rest of the story, but catch first that the disciples and the twelve, they, they acted decisively. Say we got to come up with a solution. And so they gathered the disciples together together. They gather the early Christians together and say, hey, we got to work this out. But they acknowledged as well is that they can't do it all. And they didn't want to neglect the ministry of the Word of God in order to wait on tables. So are they saying, well, wait a second. These poor ladies that are older and they're widows and they have no means of support and they don't have food. Or they, would they just rather like study the Bible than help these poor ladies that are hurting? That's not the idea. The idea is, is that they're acting, and they're going to see some solutions here to catch some shared solutions with the core responsibilities of the church. So the story goes on. You get it so far. Verse 3, just the first part of verse 3. So the 12 have gathered disciples. They said, hey, we don't think we personally can do this. Our responsibility is for teaching and ministering the Word. We're going to see a little bit later in prayer and, and core spiritual leadership. But this is important. So we got to figure out how to, how to make this happen. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom. And I love what they do here because they acknowledge a need. They acknowledge that they can't do it all. They acknowledge the importance of the ministry of the word and prayer. We're going to see that. But also the importance of compassion ministries. And then they, they, they start by appointing leaders. And some see this as, by the way, as the beginnings of the deacon role, the service role. I'm not sure it's all that well developed here. But when churches talk about elders and deacons, these might be kind of the first deacons, so to speak, or at least the beginnings of that concept that we use in churches today. And notice they appoint leaders based on Christian character. And, and, and they say, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the, of the Spirit. So by spiritual reputation, to be full of the Spirit. So they're Spirit-empowered and wisdom. And they're not talking about biblical, you know, worldly wisdom. They're talking about biblical wisdom. And a little bit later on, we see that they are also full of faith. And so if you look on your outlines, I listed spiritual reputation, spirit empowerment, biblical wisdom, and strong faith. And so they're appointing, they're trying to solve the conflict, also trying to meet needs, right? And, and fulfill some of these core responsibilities in the church, which includes ministry of the word, which includes prayer, which includes compassion. And, and they're saying, hey... Leadership in these endeavors is based on Christian character. Sometimes churches say, wow, this guy, you know, the guy or gal is a real good businessman or woman, or they're an attorney or some type of professional degree or something. So they must be a good Christian leader, right? And maybe someone with a different kind of job or what we in our culture might say is a blue collar job or something. Well, they, they're, they're not worthy for, for leading in the church. Well, baloney. That's not how the church works, right? And we're called to appoint leaders based on Christian character. And sometimes we develop these kind of business models or military models or political models uh, of, of leadership that aren't in line with Scripture. Here we see the early church, they were concerned about their spiritual reputation, they were concerned about spirit empowerment, they were concerned about biblical wisdom and having a strong faith. And so they appoint leaders based on Christian character. And they do that in this collaborative process. So here we see this need that the disciples are ministering and there's the ministry of the word happening. But the compassion ministry of caring for widows has been neglected, or at least there's a conflict over it. So they come together and say, hey, let's seek some shared solutions here, and let's begin to appoint leaders based on Christian character. Look at the end of verse 3. We will turn this responsibility over to them, and we'll get, in verse 4, and we'll give our attention to prayer in the ministry of the Word. So it's an important ministry 
but the key leaders in the church can't do it all. And wow, we live that today, right? And we, we're always reminded, and I, I'm reminded of that all the time in, in this kind of chaotically busy uh, pastoring COVID schedule. Sometimes people will joke, pastor, you know, you're not, you know, yeah, you, you don't have to do as much under COVID. It's like, really, are you kidding? You know, I'm, I'm busy all the time. And so I'm looking for opportunities in key leaders, and we ought to be looking for opportunities to share the load. And so sometimes people are concerned about pastors or Christian leaders being ultra, ultra busy. Well, one of the solutions to that is that we're called to share. And that's that's on me. And that's also on our church family where we work together and then we choose people from among us known to be full of the spirit and wisdom, their spiritual reputation, spiritual empowerment. And then we affirm the shared responsibility for diverse ministry. There's ministry of the word. There's prayer, there's compassion ministries, and these are just the three mentioned here. I put them on your on your outlines there. But there's these core ministries that we we spent several weeks talking about, sharing life in Christ, of worship and fellowship, discipleship, ministry, and witness. And we see some of these encompassed here, but we're called to a shared responsibility for diverse ministry in the body of Christ. And so we see that the church very competently will turn this responsibility over to them. So they're not. So when we go back and look at that, uh, you know, verse in, in verse two, well, we're not going to collect the ministry of the word to wait on tables. It sounds kind of callous. They're not meaning it to be. Just saying, hey, there's some responsibilities, some things that need to be done, and we're called together to do that. We're a family. We're the body of Christ, and we serve in our gifting and our unique areas to accomplish God's purposes for us. So we affirm shared responsibility for diverse ministry. So in red, I asked a key question there. I think that the scripture asked this this too. Am I available for selection to service? Am I one of the people that is available based on my Christian character, based on a desire to meet need, based on the variety of things that need to happen in the name of Christ? Am I available for a selection to service? And folks, to be honest, you know, there's two reactions for a selection to service. One is, oh, don't pick me, don't pick me, don't pick me. You know, I, I, let someone else do it. Let someone else get the job done. Let someone else handle things. And then there's this sense of availability that you know, I'm ready, right? And I'm ready to serve and I'm willing to serve. Right? And I'm ready to interact in those things and work work on my relationship with the Lord, and I want to have a, a reputation that's that's based on biblical truth, and I and I want to be spirit empowered, and I want to have I want to be known for my biblical wisdom and, and have this strong faith. So I'm ready to and I'm available for selection to service. And, and some of you might be out there saying, well, Pastor, you've never called me and asked me personally. Okay, hey, I, I get it. You know, it's okay. If if you're ready for service and no one's asked you and you're waiting for someone to ask, you know, call me up, ask me, say, hey, pastor, how can I serve in the body of Christ and in the family of God? And when people ask me that question, I will always have an answer for you. And so if you've never been asked my mistake, right, or other ministry leaders' mistake, I get that. But often, often we're like, God, just bypass me over when God calls us to be available, like these key leaders were here in the early church. So we focus on the shared responsibility. They had this little bit of a conflict. They identified the need in the conflict, and then they start working through uh, a shared solution, this collaborative process of appointing leaders, and, and, and the leadership appointment is based on Christian character, and then they're called to choose, uh, and for these, in this case, compassion ministries of helping widows. Well, let's see what happens. So that proposal pleased the whole group. And so now we're moving from focused on sh- focusing on shared responsibilities to follow through with shared service. Okay, we identify the problem. There's a bit of a conflict. Instead of ignoring it, we gather, we meet, say, hey, we need to fix this. This is important. Let's appoint some folks who's qualified out there in terms of Christian character and willing to be selected. And then, then, then now let's follow through. And they reached agreement. This proposal pleased the whole group. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit. And we're going to see a little bit of, quite a bit of interaction with him later in Acts. Also, Philip, we're going to learn more about him as well. Uh, Prochorus and, and Nicanor and Tim, Timon, uh, Parmenas and, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. So they mentioned seven people by name. And I love that because I put on your outline, outlines this. Seek 
unified collaboration, you know, as the as the leaders proposed, here's a solution to this problem. And then the whole group, you know, they, they're unified, they buy in it together. And then they chose people by name and seek unified collaboration by na- in by name service. And, and I put that in quotes on your outline. I said, Pastor, what are, what are you talking about, Brian? It's this idea that we're willing to step up and be identified by name as wanting to be involved in the shared responsibility of Christian service. We'll want to stand up and say, hey, I'm Brian, right? And I am ready to serve in the name of Jesus Christ. And I love that Luke lists their name names here. It, it affirms the, the historical accuracy of it, but it also teaches us that we're called to work together. And, and, and the, the, the 12 propose and everybody comes together on that. And then they choose key people. And these aren't just imaginary people. These are real people. Sometimes people in churches, they have this idea, well, I wish we were doing that. And I wish we were doing that. And how come we're not doing that? And, and 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 church leaders will often say, well, okay, let's put a name with those things. And does that name include your name? And are you ready to be selected? Do you have a Christian character that says, okay, I can serve in these capacities, right? Am I growing in my faith and am I ready to serve in the name of Jesus Christ? And am I, and I, am I willing to be called by name in service? Not just, I'll oh, put me way down on the list. If it's the last possible resort, then I'll do it. No. We're ready to say, I, Brian Ostring, am ready to serve in this specific capacity, and I'm committing to it. See that perspective there? So they picked these seven people. Verse 6, they presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So they reach agreement together. And then they set them apart for ministry, in this case, these compassion-based ministries of caring for vulnerable, the widows in their case. And then they pray for them and they equip them. And I love what happens here, that the spiritual leaders of the church, what we call like elders today, right? They're involved in service, but notice that service was focused on ministry of the word in prayer, right? And that's people like me and other key leaders in the church. It's not just about doing all the variety of things that kind of need done around here, the duties, the physical duties, but there's folks that God appoints to serve in spiritual ministry, ministry of the word. So I can communicate like this with you in ministry and connection and mentoring and discipleship and then ministering in prayer as well. It'd be fascinating. I was thinking about what if I spent 20 hours a week in prayer and the other 20 hours or whatever it might be or 40 hours invested in other things. What would that look like for our church? Would there be people in our church say, Pastor, you're wasting your time. 20 hours a week in prayer, you ought not to do that. But I love what these early church leaders did here. They wanted to give their attention to prayer and to the ministry of the word, praying and teaching God's people. And to be honest, often in my own life, I focus on the ministry of the word to the detriment of time for prayer and I focus on meeting physical needs and I sometimes miss and I'm sure other key leaders do as well that attention to prayer like we see with the early disciples. So they present these men to the apostles and because these other physical needs need to be done compassion ministries are important and the apostles say okay this is great we've worked together we've worked on a unified collaboration we've identified some people by name and now we're going to follow through and notice that they are sanctified They are set apart for service through prayer and then this laying on of hands. And it's really a conferral of authority. It's really a conferral of blessing. It's this sense of commissioning. And that's what I put on your outline. We sanctify service through prayer and commissioning. You know, folks, when we serve in the name of Christ and we serve in a local church and represent Jesus Christ as the body of Christ, it's not like Serving in the Boy Scouts. I I serve in the Boy Scouts. I'm a Boy Scout leader. It's not like serving with 4-H or the Rotary or something like that. Those things are important and good. Or serving, you know, as a a coach for an athletic team. Those are are good and those are wonderful things to do in our community. But it's not like we're just kind of signing up, okay, they need something, so I'm going to do this. Folks, when we are selected to serve in ministry in a local church, that involves prayer, it involves a commissioning, and we are serving in the name of Jesus Christ himself. And we're set apart for that kind of service. So it makes Christian service in the name of Christ very, very distinctive. 
So we follow through with this shared service. We seek collaboration. We're willing to step up and say, okay, name me. I'm ready. I've got the Christian character. I want to serve. And then we sanctify that service. And folks, if you're here, if you're listening and you're one of our Christian leaders, we're, we're praying and we're appointing and, and we're blessing the people that serve together with us. What happens when we do this? This is really a simple case study, I think, when we, we identify need in this conflict, but then what we see is that they've met the need, they've shared the load, but then in consensus, and they work together in this collaborative process of solving a genuine need and meeting a genuine problem. And, and, and I love that conflict is kind of normal, right, when we're sinful people, but how we handle it really makes a difference. And so they, they've worked through this process. What's the result? And Luke records several summary statements throughout the book of Acts, and we get one right here. Verse 7, so the word of God spread. See, they worked together and they understood that there's shared ministry responsibility, and they focused on these shared responsibilities, and they had this misunderstanding, and they said, let's come together and unify and working toward a solution. Let's appoint some people based on their Christian character, and then some people are willing to serve. They're willing to be, they're available for selection, and they present these men. And so what happens, and they pray over them, and they equip them, and, and they're authorized, they're blessed, they're commissioned for service and the word of God spreads. And the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. So people respond. The church grows. They grow in faith, and they grow in the numbers that are responding in faith. It works, and they savor, and I put on your outlines, we savor this increasing ministry effectiveness. God shows up and does something quite beautiful when we work together and we share the load. In red, I put on your outlines. You know, that first question was, am I available for selection? And that, am I appointed for a season of service? It's, it's one thing to say, I'm available. But God doesn't intend for that availability just to kind of hang out there forever. God wants us to be appointed for a season of service. And some services come and go. And so we might serve in some capacity for two weeks. We might serve in another capacity for for decades, but we're called not only to be available, we're called to then be appointed, right? And I encourage you, what is God appointing you? What is our church family appointing you to do? We, we, want, to, we want to be available and grow in our Christian character. And that might be interacting with some ministry leaders or, or me or the other, the other leaders of the church saying, well, pastor, what does this availability look like? What are some ministry options? We're always throwing those out there via email and, and, and the bulletins. And then what would it look like for me to be appointed to a season of service in a compassion ministry or in a ministry of the word or a prayer ministry? And folks, I assure you, in the name of Jesus Christ, what we see over and over again in Scripture is that there is always service available in the name of Christ and in the body of Christ. And if for some reason you're saying, oh, I've been overlooked or I've been neglected or I haven't been appreciated, well, reach, reach out to me. Let me know. Or if you're hearing you saying, you know, I've been one of those that's kind of like turning away and saying, yeah, don't pick me, don't pick me, don't pick me. Maybe this is the week that we say, okay, I want to be available and I'm ready to be appointed for a season of service. And, you know, as we head to the Lord's table, I love what Jesus has done on our behalf. And I encourage you, if you haven't already, uh, have your communion supplies ready. If you have one of these, remember you got to take that little plastic part off and then catch catch the wafer there, but maybe you have your own supplies. When we're called to service and we're called to serve each other, we're always reminded that Jesus Christ served us first. And as he served us, and then he gives that example. Remember when he washed the disciples' feet, he says, hey, this is an example that I want you to follow. So we are all called, whatever stage of life we're in, right? And you say, well, I, I can't do anything. Folks, you know, one of the core uh, principles that in one of the core things our church is called to is a prayer life, right? And if you can understand my words as you're hearing this right now, you can spend time in prayer before the Lord, right? And so I think there's options, all kinds of options available for service. But I encourage you as you go to serve, remember that 
leaders were appointed based on Christian character that was centered on spirit empowerment in the name of Christ. And when we gather and when we serve and we take the Lord's table, we're reminded that Christ served us first through his death, burial, and resurrection. And when we take communion together in person or remotely like this, we're reminded that Christ's service included his physical death on our behalf. And the night before he died, he took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body broken for you that's due in remembrance of me. Will you partake with me? He also took the cup. And if you have one of the ones from the church, you got to pull that back a little bit. And I know it's sometimes a little hard. Or maybe you have your own supplies there. And he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. So I encourage you as we drink this, when we're remembering Jesus' death and we're remembering his service on our behalf. And that's how we receive forgiveness of sins. And it, I encourage you to consider this also as a call to follow Jesus' example of availability and an appointment for a season of service. So let's partake together. And uh, he took that cup of redemption as part of the Passover. And he said this do in remembrance of me. Will you partake with me? Will you pray with me, please? Father, we're thankful that you call us to shared responsibility. We understand that conflict is real and need is real. And, and we're not always going to see eye to eye just like the Greek background uh, Christians did and, and um, Greek background Jewish Christians and the and the Jerusalem background Jewish Christians, right? And, and all that conflict that came there, Lord. And, and But they figured it out. And that figuring it out included sharing the load in a variety of different ministries in the name of Christ. And so, God, as your people, may we be available. May we be available for appointment to service. May we understand that you desire us to serve in all the wonderfully unique ways that you gift us in. And God, help us to share that load and help us as church leaders to be looking for ways of sharing the load. You're not impressed by, by us um, just being overwhelmed because we're not sharing. And Father, you're not, you're not pleased with us when we bypass our responsibility either. So for some, we struggle with doing too much. For some, we struggle with not doing enough. So God, show us, illuminate that. Uh, connect us up with ministry leaders. Connect us with people and, and, and help our ministry leaders to be available and, and ready to, to, to ask people to serve and to engage in ministry. And God, may we be ready for being selected and, and appointed. May, may we uh, make our availability known that we're ready to serve. And then God, may we never say no to, to service in the name of Christ because we are mature in our faith and we're ready to serve you. And Father, if there's some that's you think, well, I don't have a good spiritual reputation. I don't. I, I, I'm not ready. I'm not spirit empowered. Let this week be the week where they grow in faith and where we connect with each other and we grow in faith and we're ready to serve in your name. And we have a good spiritual reputation because we are following Jesus Christ. Father, thank you that the example of service doesn't reside in, in humans like us that are fallible. And sinful, but it resides in Jesus Christ. And we thank you so much for the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus for forgiveness of sins. Thank you that we have the privilege of serving together and appointing people for ministry. And God, may we all engage in a season of service. For some, we need to keep enduring. For others, maybe for the first time, we engage to a new season of service in the name of Christ. We pray all these things according to your mercy, your will, and your strength, and your authority. Amen.